Thank you, Ted. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be together today. It's always a blessing to be able to worship the Lord. It's always a blessing to have the bread and the cup together. And it's a blessing to be able to dive into the word together. And I want to begin by asking the Lord to speak to us, to speak through me as we look a bit more closely at his word today. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you so much for your desire to make yourself known to us. It is your heart to reveal yourself that we might know you. And Father, we will never fully, fully comprehend just how much you have humbled yourself to make yourself known to us. Because you are infinitely greater than us. You are infinitely beyond us. And yet you have willingly spoken to us in words that we can understand. Made yourself known to us in a way that we can comprehend. And certainly, Father, that requires you humbling yourself to an incredible measure. But Lord, we are grateful now and we will be eternally grateful that you have done that. Because now, Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ, we can know you. And Jesus, when answering one of the questions of your apostles, you said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so, Father, we know you because of Jesus. We see you because of Jesus. We draw close to you because of Jesus. And Father, as we spend some time this morning, look at at one of your accounts of how you brought into being the universe that we see, Genesis chapter 1. We realize, Lord, that there will always be a glory that is beyond us. There will always be a depth that is greater than what our human minds can comprehend. And yet, Lord God, you've given us the account of Genesis 1. And so we want to take time now to look at it and to gain from it, Lord, what you would have us to gain. It is your word, it is your account, it is your creation, it is your universe. And so we pray now, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would make yourself known to us as the creator. And what was and is in your heart when you created and now when you redeem creation, help us to know you better. And we ask these things, Jesus, in your name alone. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to look today at the account of creation that is found in Genesis chapter 1 and works its way through to the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. As Ted mentioned earlier, we are beginning a new corporate Bible reading plan. We are no longer going to be reading a chapter a day, working our way through the entirety of Scripture. We completed that a couple of weeks ago and very, very grateful for the season when we did that. What we began last week is looking at a couple of sections of Scripture sort of a week at a time. So last week we looked at four passages. So obviously there's seven days in a week, so that's not quite a chapter a day. The main focus of what we are going to be doing together is we're going to be preaching our way through the book of Genesis. But because we wanted you to be in the New Testament as well, we will assign some New Testament reading along with that. But last week we were reading together Genesis 1 and 2 and Romans 1 and 2. But we will not get into Romans 1 and 2 at all today. Starting tomorrow and the upcoming week, we will be reading Genesis 3 and Romans 3 and 4. But our vision as elders is that we will be preaching our way through the book of Genesis. We don't have a set end time for this. We've begun to break the book down into preachable segments. But there's no way we're going to cover everything. This is not going to be us literally preaching every verse of the book of Genesis. So last week we read Genesis 1 and 2. We will not at all get to the second account of creation in Genesis 2. We just, we won't have time. And what we're going to find out is we won't even get to half of what is put before us in Genesis 1. But that is where we're going to spend some time together today. So that's sort of the plan. If you are on the email uh, updates and prayer chain, you are getting that schedule via the email electronically. There are small blue strips of paper in the back that have the next four weeks of our plan laid out, and we will be giving it to you sort of a month at a time. One other thing to keep in mind is that we will not necessarily be preaching from Genesis every Sunday. So if there is a Sunday where we will be preaching a different passage, you will simply have a reading assignment for two weeks instead of one. So that will happen for our 100th celebration 
On November the 19th, we will not necessarily be preaching from Genesis that week, so that reading will, will, will cover two weeks. So anyways, that's just a little bit of, of housekeeping and administration before we begin. So today we are going to look at the account of creation in Genesis chapter 1. And one of the things that we need to realize is that in Genesis 1 and 2, there are two parallel, complementary accounts of creation. The first one begins in Genesis 1-1 and goes through about midway through Genesis 2-4. That is the account that we know of as the six days of creation and God resting on the seventh day. Then beginning in the middle of Genesis 2-4 through the end of chapter 2, there is a second account of creation. And it is focusing particularly on the creation of man and woman and their placement in the garden that God created for them. Now, these two accounts are not identical. These two accounts emphasize different things. These two accounts sometimes put things a little bit different in terms of sequence. But what we want to do as we are reading these accounts is to see them as complementary, to see them as being parallel to each other, not in conflict or opposition. There are actually in the Psalms a couple of places where creation is recorded in incredibly poetic terms. Other accounts of creation in Scripture. John chapter 1 is another account of creation as the Spirit inspired the Apostle of John to give a fuller understanding of what was happening. So as we see these varying accounts of creation, we should never come to them thinking, well, don't they conflict with each other? Don't they contradict each other? Absolutely not. They are complementary to each other, and they are different ways of approaching the same thing, just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four different accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, not emphasizing identical things, but certainly not in conflict with each other. Another thing that I want to say right off the bat is that Genesis chapter 1 is not a science textbook. It is not. It is not a biology textbook. It is not an astronomy textbook. It is not a geology textbook. It is not. And if we try to read Genesis 1 as modern, post-Enlightenment, post-Renaissance, post-Reformation Westerners and read it as a scientific textbook, we are missing God's point. God was not primarily concerned when he gave us Genesis 1 to give us scientific details of how he created all that is created. Now, that being said, any true science, any accurate science will not disagree with any of the truth presented in Genesis. Because Genesis is part of the eternal word of God. It is inspired and it is inerrant. There are those that the Lord has called to dive deeply into the realms of science. So we have Christians who are astrophysicists, who are geologists, who are botanists, who are biologists, and they are diving deeply into the universe that God has created to discover more of its wonders. If they are doing science in a way that honors the Lord, they will never come to conclusions that directly contradict any of the accounts in Genesis 1 or anything else in Scripture. And so we need to hold both of those things. Genesis 1 is not a science textbook. We are not going to read it that way. We are not going to approach it that way. It is a theological passage. But it will never disagree with true science. And if there is something that is being declared in science that clearly stands against any of the teaching of Genesis chapter 1, then that science is flawed. You know, you've heard this said Maybe before, maybe not. You know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the driving force behind science was the belief that there is a God. Science and belief in God were not at odds with each other. In fact, some of the earliest scientists and even some of the Western European scientists, they were absolutely driven by the fact that there is a God. 
And because there is a God who has created everything that is created, the universe, this earth, and different aspects of this earth are studyable, are discoverable. Why does an apple always fall when I let it out of my hand? Sir Isaac Newton believed in God and his evaluation of gravity wasn't driven by atheism, wasn't driven by the fact that we've moved beyond God. It was driven by his firm conviction that there is God. And there is a predictability in creation because God is faithful to his creation. And that is how, for hundreds of years, people approach science. It is only a relatively recent phenomenon of the last couple hundred years that science has tried to divorce itself from theism. That science has tried to separate itself from that conviction that there is a God. And this divorce of science and theism is incredibly recent. And so we should have absolutely no problems wanting to embrace science. That's not me. I was a biology major for four years. Most of it I have forgotten. I dove deeply into the theories of evolution, what they espoused, tried to line them up with my firm convictions of God being the creator. And so there is a call for that. And there are incredibly brilliant women and men who have PhDs in all manner of science who absolutely love Jesus and love God and love his word and are showing that this does not have to stand in disagreement with science. It does not. Now, I can't argue that way. I remember even back in college, Campus Crusade for Christ at the time, now crew, brought in a believing astrophysicist. He had a PhD in astrophysics, and he loved the Lord, and he loved God's word, and I didn't understand a single word of his lecture. But I said, you know what, Lord? I know he's there, and I'm glad he's there. He's talking about things that I can't understand, but... Praise God that he's there. And even though a lot of times there's incredible pressure in Western academia not to espouse a belief in God, there are believers everywhere, particularly in this country, who love the Lord and believe the accounts of Genesis 1 and 2 and do not see science in opposition to that. And yet oftentimes, because of the pressure of the institution that they are at, they have to keep very quiet about that. Now, most of us, we don't move in those realms. You know, Richard Waring, I thought maybe Richard would be here. He has a PhD. My wife has a PhD. My brother-in-law has a master's in geology. So there are some in our midst who are doing a deeper dive into science. But what I want to clearly say is that science does not have to stand in opposition to belief in God. And Genesis 1 is not to be taken as a science textbook, but it will not disagree with accurate science. But here's one other thing, and I apologize, this is a longer introduction than I expected. If you are studying the universe that God has made, whether you're studying the, the, the cosmos, the stars, whether you are studying the plants that he made, whether you are studying the sea creatures he made, whether you are studying the rocks and the mountains that he made, if you are studying the universe that God made, and you are denying that he exists, you will never fully understand the creation he made. And the absolute arrogance of unbelieving science to say that they know better how God's universe structured and put together and functions, they are absolutely wrong. You cannot. You can never fully understand anything that God our creator has made if you don't believe he exists. If you do not believe he exists, no matter how profound your intelligence is, no matter how high your IQ is, no matter how many words you can use that nobody else on the planet understands, you will never fully understand God's creation if you are denying him. And we as Christians, we cannot be scientific wimps. We cannot. And we cannot let the unbelieving world tell us how God put his universe together. There's a verse in Ephesians where the Apostle Paul says, they are darkened in their reasoning. They are darkened in their thinking. They are darkened in all of their human intelligence with all of their degrees and all of their IQ. They're darkened in their thinking. Why? Because of the hardness 
of their heart. What you believe absolutely affects what you think. And so if you believe there is no God, if you believe all of this happened by chance and coincidence and luck, then you will never rightly understand the universe that God has made. Now, again, I'm saying that as someone who cannot speak in great depth about astrophysics or biology or geochemistry or any of that, but I am speaking as someone who understands the Lord and understands his word. And I absolutely understand that this is the universe that God has made. And if you are going to do a deep dive into science, if that's what the Lord has called you to, that's wonderful. Praise God for that. But you will never fully understand the universe that God has made if you don't acknowledge that he made it. The very first step that you have to take, you've already tripped and stumbled. Anyways, I apologize. That was longer than I expected to be. I really want us to have some fun today. Genesis chapter 1. I was going back to my seminary notes all the way back to 1992. Some of you were not even born in 19... Well, most of you are up here. You were born by 1992. 1992, I'm taking a class in seminary with a professor named Doug Green. He's actually retired. This was his first time teaching this class. He gave a lecture on Genesis chapter 1 that just profoundly changed me. I had read the Bible. I'd read Genesis 1. I'd never looked at Genesis 1 the way he was presenting it. I'm going to fall woefully short of how he taught it. If Doug were here, I'd call Doug up and say, Doug, take over, please. I don't know where he is, but hopefully he's doing well. But it just, it transformed me. And hopefully a little bit of that I'm going to be able to impart to you today. Because Genesis chapter 1 is glorious. Genesis chapter 1 is incredible. Genesis chapter 1 is just an amazing text for us to examine. So let's just start by reading the first couple of verses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word that is used there certainly can mean earth, but sometimes it's more accurately translated land. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the land. And really, when you're beginning the book of Genesis, when you're beginning the first five books of our Old Testament, land is absolutely central. Just think now, even in terms of the Old Testament, how central the promised land is to understanding what God was doing before his son came into the world. So it might even be better to say that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the land. Now, there is a bit of a picture that's given to us in verse 2. It says, now the earth, in NIV it says, the earth was formless and empty. These two words oftentimes go together, tohu and bohu. They're easy words to remember. They oftentimes go together. Sometimes tohu by itself, bohu is never by itself. But what exactly was meant when God inspired Moses, if he was the one writing this or someone else, to describe that earth in the beginning? And as God was creating, it was tohu and it was bohu. Well, formless maybe is not the best way to take it. Other places where tohu is used, it usually is describing a desert. It is usually describing a land that is completely unfruitful, a wasteland. There are other places that this word occurs. So formless, maybe, but probably not so much formless as something that is completely unfruitful, unproductive, a barren waste. Now, again, you have to understand in the ancient world, agriculture was everything. And so a barren waste, an unfruitful, an unproductive land was awful. It was threatening because if your very existence depended on being able to grow things out of the land, if the land was completely unfruitful, if it was a barren waste, you were not going to make it. So a very menacing introduction here. Then the word bohu, here it says empty. That's a pretty good translation. Another way we may take it is uninhabited. No occupants, no residents. So in the beginning... As God created the heaven and the land, it was a waste, an unfruitful, barren land without any inhabitants. That in and of itself would have been very menacing, would have been very intimidating, would have been very hopeless 
for an ancient Near Easterner, the first to hear this account. We're told more details. It says, darkness was over the surface of the deep. Well, there's two other things that would have been incredibly intimidating in the ancient world. The deep, excellent translation there, a vast, bottomless expanse of water. In the ancient world, water was incredibly intimidating. Revelation chapter 21, small little detail. In the new heavens and the new earth, what is missing? The sea. There is no sea in the new heavens and the new earth. Why? Because in the ancient world, the sea represented what was uncontrollable, what was untamable. It was the realm of chaos. It was the realm of unknown. It was the realm to be feared. That's why storms on water were always so incredibly intimidating to folks in the ancient world. Because it was literally that untamable, uncontrolled realm of chaos whipping itself into a furor or a frenzy. You see, we're starting to think the way some of the original audience would have thought. None of this is contradicting modern science. And yet, you can see this is not a scientific treatise. Hopefully, you're starting to pick that up. This doesn't contradict with science. This simply is not hammering the same issues that science hammers. So what do you have? You have this barren wasteland without any inhabitants. Then you have the deep covering it, the realm of chaos, the realm of uncontrolled unknown covering that. And then on top of that, a third layer. What do you have? Darkness. Well, again, in the ancient world, darkness was an incredibly intimidating thing. Think of the ninth plague of the Lord on Egypt. Darkness. You couldn't just turn on your cell phone light. You couldn't just have street lights everywhere. You couldn't just flip a switch. Basically speaking, in the ancient world, most of life stopped when the sun set. You got up with the sun because now you could see and now you could do the things that you had to do and you went to bed or ended your day when the sun set, excuse me, when the sun rose, you started your day. When the sun set, your day ended because you couldn't really see. I mean, yeah, you had a torch maybe or, you know, eventually an oil lamp or a pile of sticks. But like if you were around the campfire, once you stepped away from that, there was no light unless the moon was out. So darkness, also relatively intimidating. So what you have here painted for us in verse 2 is a picture of absolute chaos and a fearful situation. A barren, uninhabited wasteland covered by a deep with darkness on top of it. If you want to have an ancient Near Eastern horror story, verse 2 is just that. Another thing to keep in mind, in a lot of the ancient myths of creation. The account of Genesis is not the only account of creation in ancient history. It's the only God-inspired, inerrant account of creation. But there are other cultures, ancient Near Eastern cultures, that have creation myths. And in every single one of them, creation is a struggle. Creation is a fight. The God who ultimately is the God that creates in whatever pagan myth you're looking at has to defeat an opponent, an enemy, forces of chaos. So one of the first things that we as modern readers probably do not get, but that an ancient reader would have captured right away, is God creates without a struggle. God creates without a fight. You could not have had a more intimidating situation than those three layers that we have been describing. But for God, they're nothing. He's not intimidated. He's not frustrated. He does not struggle to create the glorious creation that we see from that chaotic, intimidating mess. One of the most profound truths of Genesis 1 that's lost to most of us as moderners 
is that God creates without a struggle. As was already mentioned earlier in the service, he simply speaks. And it comes to be. And this is such an incredible reminder. Yes, there are ferocious enemies. Yes, there are horrifically awful, demonic, satanic adversaries that are doing everything that they can to come against the Lord and to come against us. But God defeats them without a fight. He simply does what he does. And so that's one of the main things that we need to gather from Genesis chapter 1, is that God creates without a fight. We also need to understand that Genesis chapter 1 is not poetry, but it is poetry-like. There is a, a rhythm to it. There is a symmetry to it. So it's very highly stylized narrative. We know the pattern. There was evening. There was morning the first day. There was evening. There was morning a second day. And so even though it is narrative and not poetry per se, it's highly stylized narrative. And that's part of the beauty of it. But part of it also was just to give us an account of creation that's not only awesome in its content, but awesome in its style. The word of God is beautiful. The word of God is glorious. And this is one of those passages. The fact that the pattern is there was evening and there was morning. This is why in the Jewish way of thinking, the day doesn't begin at midnight. The day doesn't begin at sunrise. In the Jewish way of thinking, when does the day begin? At sunset. To this day. The Jewish Sabbath begins at sunset on Friday. The Jewish day begins at sunset. Why? Why did they think that way? Genesis chapter 1. It is not there was morning, there was evening a first day. That's the way we would think of it. It's there was evening, there was morning a first day. So anytime you're looking at the start of days in the Bible, when you're looking at, say, the feasts that are established in the law of Moses, when you're looking at the days around the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you need to understand from a Jewish perspective, the day always begins at sunset. That's the beginning of the new day. That's what is taken from that pattern in Genesis. Well, let's start to read a little bit. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So what we see here now is that in each of the first three days, God is going to be creating in each of those first three regions that were mentioned. Remember, darkness over the deep, over a barren, unfruitful, uninhabited land. So on day one, in the realm of darkness, what is God doing? He's creating light. Darkness was already there. That did not have to be created. He is creating light. And so now he is making a division within the realm of darkness. Now it is not just darkness. Now there is darkness and there is light. He is dividing and he is limiting. He is dividing now the realm of darkness. It's not the only realm that exists on the upper level of pre-creation universe. It is now divided and darkness has limitations because light is now present. Interestingly enough, we are not told the source of light. Because on what day are the sun, moon, and stars created? Day four. This is not science. But what we're told in Revelation, in the new heavens and the new earth, what provides the light in the new Jerusalem? The glory of the Lord. So again, if we're approaching this with a scientific mindset, the first question we ask from day one is, well, what was producing the light? 
God doesn't want us to know. God doesn't care that we know that. He simply is telling us now that in this first realm of intimidating, fearful chaos, the realm of darkness, the uppermost realm of this pre-creation mass, he is now speaking. And he is speaking light into existence. And now there is light existing in this upper realm. And now darkness has limitations. Another thing that is often repeated in Genesis is naming. He called the light day. He called the darkness night. What is indicated from an ancient perspective in the process of naming? If you name something, you have authority over it. Think of Adam naming the animals. What was God saying? God was saying to Adam, I give you authority over the animals that I have made. You therefore have authority to name them. When parents name a child, there is a measure of authority there. So what God is declaring in simply naming is that I have authority over my creation. I have the authority to name what I make. I call it day. I call it night. Again, another incredible declaration of the power and the authority of God. Let's continue now. This is verse 6. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. So again, thinking of darkness, the deep, fruitless, barren land. Day one, God is creating in the realm of darkness. He's creating light. Day two, where is God creating? He's creating in the realm of the deep. Day one, he is separating light from darkness as he creates light. He's giving boundaries and limitations to the darkness. Day two, what is he doing? He's separating the water. He's separating the deep. He is taming the untamable, chaotic deep. And how does he do it? By speaking. And he separates. And now there is water above and there is water below. There's a Hebrew word that's used here that this NIV translates as expanse. Some of your translations may say firmament. Again, it's just, it's, it's a concept we don't really have. It's this idea that if you are standing on earth and looking at creation, there are things that are above you that look like they're embedded in the dome of the sky. And again, this is not trying to be a science textbook, and this is not disagreeing with science. Because if you are standing on earth and you are looking at the sky, there are things that are above you. And it basically does kind of form a circle all around you. This is the word that's used there. It's the Hebrew word rakia. We don't have an English word for it. The verb raka actually meant to pound something out, to pound metal out very, very thin if you were plating something. So this idea of rakia is, is something that is pounded out very thin. So it's this idea that if you were standing on earth and you look up, you see all these things that are above you. And of course, we didn't have astronomy the way we have it now. We didn't have astronauts the way I, so no one had actually gone up there, but that's how it looked. And again, there is no error. There is no inaccuracy in looking at creation from a human earthbound perspective. And that's what Genesis 1 is doing. It's not contradicting science. It's just simply not speaking as a highly evolved science textbook. So there is this rakia and there's really expanse is a good word for it. Firmament is a good word for it. At the end of this, God's going to name it the sky. So that's what it is. It's the sky. But what it is doing, it's separating. It's putting limits. It's putting limits to water above. It's putting limits to water below. And again, from an ancient perspective, where was water? Well, there was water below, primarily the oceans and the seas, but also rivers and pools and things like that. But there was also water above because it would rain and the rain would come down and there was water above you. So God was simply giving a perspective to that water above you. When you look at the flood of Noah, it is absolutely 
building on this because where did the water come from? It came from above, but it came from below. So one way of understanding the flood of Noah, it was the undoing of creation. Because the water that was now being contained on the second day, the water that was being separated, the lower water and the upper water, God setting boundaries to it as he divided it. When the flood came, God was undoing that. He was undoing creation because of the incredible wickedness and sinfulness of humanity. And again, this isn't inaccurate. The rain doesn't come from below. The rain still comes from above. We understand now in more detail how this water vapor forms clouds. And when the clouds reach, I don't understand meteorology, but when they reach a certain temperature or density or whatever, it starts to rain and there's water coming down from above. I mean, so this is absolutely accurate. This is absolutely dependable, but it's not a meteorological treatise. So second day, second realm, the deep. God dividing, God separating, God giving limits. And again, doing it all simply by speaking. Let's continue. Day three. I can't see the verse. You guys know where the third day begins. Uh, verse nine. My eyes are getting weaker or the numbers in my Bible are getting smaller. I don't know which. It says, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God saw, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so, and the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds, according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So now that third level, that barren wasteland, is now the realm of God's activity. He separated the upper waters from the lower waters, but the lower waters are still covering that barren wasteland. So now he is containing the lower waters. Day two, he contains and separates the upper waters from the lower waters. Day three, he separates and contains the lower waters from the dry ground. Again, you see this incredible, beautiful, poetic description. Separation, limitation. Separation, limitation. This is what God is doing with that darkness and that deep and that barren wasteland. He is speaking into it. He is speaking into it his good creation. And his good creation is light. And his good creation is putting limits on the destructive forces of the chaotic mass. His creation is transforming what was unfruitful and empty. So as the dry ground appears, there is an extension to that because it isn't just a barren wasteland, but what also appears on day three, every manner of plants and vegetation and fruit bearing trees. There are other places in scripture where God talks about, he's the one that tells the seas, you shall go this far and no further. He is the one that protects the land. You know, I don't want to get into a political discussion all about global warming, but if the waters are starting to take back the land from a Genesis 1 perspective, what is that saying? That because of human sinfulness, God is undoing the good work of creation. Because of human sinfulness, God is undoing the good work of creation, putting a limits to the sea. It's still God's creation. It's still God's world. This is my father's world, one of my grandmother's favorite hymns, one of my favorite hymns. But as we start to think in theological terms, what is Genesis telling us? It's not telling the mechanics of how glaciers are melting and water levels are rising. It's telling us the theology behind that. It's telling us that a good God created a good universe, created a good land, and put limits 
to destructive forces out of his abundant kindness to creation, but in our willful sinfulness, in our absolute rebellion against God, one of his just judgments against us is to undo some of the good work of creation. We've already talked about that's the way we need to understand the flood. It's God undoing that containing of the upper and the lower waters because of the intense wickedness and sinfulness of humanity. So on day three, the land appears and the lower waters is given boundaries and limits. And God says, you shall go no further than that. And then the abundant fruitfulness of all the plants and all the fruit bearing trees. Some folks just went apple picking. We still enjoy the incredible fruit that God has provided on this planet. And at the end of day three, it's no longer a barren, unfruitful wasteland. It's a life-giving, life-producing, farmable, productive land. So the first three days of creation, God speaks. He speaks division. He speaks limitation. He speaks his good character into creation. And at the end of day three, the problem of Tohu, fruitless, barren wasteland, is gone. It's gone. This is how the ancient Near Easterner would have thought of this. What an incredibly glorious declaration of the power of our God. To take this intimidating, fearful, chaotic mess and speak his goodness into it. But... The land is fruitful, but it's still uninhabited. There is still the problem of Bohu. The realms are still empty. So what is God going to do on the next three days of creation? He is going to create inhabitants for the realms that he established on the first three days of creation. We don't even have to read this because now you know it. What realm did God establish on day one? The realm of light. Separating now endless expanse of darkness. That is now contained. That is now limited. And just think of all the places where the scriptures talk about the hope of the new day. The hope of the sun rising. Sorrow may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. There's so much incredible theological significance to the rising of the sun. Because if you go back to Genesis 1, what the rising of the sun is declaring is that God has set limits to darkness. Darkness cannot ultimately prevail anymore. In Genesis 1-2, darkness was prevailing. That's all there was. But since Genesis 1-3 and following, darkness has limits. And God has brought his light as a good aspect of his good creation into being. You can see this is theology. This is a declaration of who our God is. It doesn't disagree with science. You can be a Jesus-loving, God-fearing, Bible-believing, geochemist, astrophysicist, and not have a problem with what God declares in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And I hope more and more are pursuing that not being intimidated by the atheist stronghold of academia that says you're an idiot if you believe in God and you cannot practice good science if you believe in God. But anyways, that's back to the introduction. You can see that frustrates me. It frustrates me. It frustrates my wife. It frustrates Richard Waring. The most intelligent man I've ever met, a guy by the name of Vern Poitras, and if he were here, he'd be embarrassed I'm telling this story. At 23 years old, he got a PhD in mathematics from Harvard University. As far as I, I know, he's still the youngest man to ever receive a PhD in mathematics from Harvard at that age, 23 years old. He wrote a book on creation that I think John Runkle has. I lent it to him years ago because I tried to read it. I couldn't understand it. I don't know. John, John is probably smart enough that he read it and he could understand it. I don't know if you still have it. Vern Poitras. One of the most intelligent men I've ever met, obviously a man of science, a man of mathematics, a man of STEM, 
went on to get his degree in, in theology from Stellenbosch in South Africa. And you know what? He loves this. His intelligence hasn't got him to think that God doesn't exist. His advanced degrees, his incredible ability to understand mathematics and other aspects of science hasn't convinced him that God doesn't exist. It's convinced him all the more that God does exist. It brings him to his knees to worship him because of the incredible universe that God has made. I'm sorry, you can see I keep going back to that because that really bugs me. Anyhow, second three days of creation, absolutely parallel to the first three days of creation. Each realm that was established on the first three days of creation, each boundary and limitations that were set on the first three days of creation, now God occupies them with inhabitants. Who or what are the inhabitants of light and darkness? Sun, moon, and stars. So they are created on the fourth day. The first three days, God is solving the problem of Tohu. The second three days, God is solving the problem of Bohu. He is creating now inhabitants for each of the realms he established on the first three days. So day four is parallel to day one. Day one is the creation of light. Day four is the creation of the inhabitants of the realm of light and darkness. Sun, moon, and star. Day five, parallel to day two. Which realms did God establish? He was dealing with that deep, that great expanse of chaotic water. Remember, he separates upper water from lower water. He does it with the rakia. The rakia he calls sky. Well, what critters live in the sky? Birds. What does he make on the fifth day? Birds. What critters live in the waters, live in the ocean, fish, all manners of sea creatures? What else does he make on the fifth day? He makes all manners of sea creatures. You see the incredible beauty, the incredible parallel. The realms that are made on day two, the upper water and the lower water, with the rakia separating them. Now God on day five is creating inhabitants for those realms. The birds to live above the earth, between the rakia and the earth, the fish and all the other sea creatures that marine biologists could tell us about, to live in the deep. Day six, he separates the lower water from the dry ground and he establishes the dry ground and then makes it a verdant, luxurious, green, fruitful, agrable land. So on day six, what does he create? He creates inhabitants for the dry ground because that's what he created on day three. So on day six, he now creates inhabitants for it. So he creates domesticated animals and wild animals, all the animals that squirm and slither. And, and the word there is to team or to, to, to get all over themselves like insects do or like rodents do. You know, they're fallen. Creation has fallen. That's another chapter, another message. But God created them. If you don't like bugs, yeah, okay, that's okay. But God created them. If you don't like squirmy worms, that's okay. But God created them. God created all of them. Now, creation has fallen, so everything that we see has fallen. But God created it all. And you see, there is absolutely a uniqueness to the creation of man and woman in the six-day account of Genesis, but not even with their own day. Why? Because humanity, along with cattle and worms and insects, live on the dry ground with all of them. So following the creation pattern of Genesis 1, yes, humanity is uniquely made in the likeness and image of God. Absolutely. But the real spotlight on humanity is given far more voice in Genesis chapter 2. A parallel account. So here, everything that lives on the land is created on day six. And so at the end of day six, the problem of Bohu is gone. The first three days, God establishes realms and he establishes a luxuriant, verdant, green land. The problem of barren wasteland is gone. On the next three days, he creates inhabitants for each of the realms that he established on the first three days. And at the end of day six, 
there are no longer empty realms. There are no longer uninhabited regions of God's creation. And now it's so much easier to remember on what days God created what things because we see the beauty of it. We see the symmetry of it. We see the pattern of it. And through it all, God is speaking his goodness into his creation. So if you want to understand one of the central themes of Genesis 1 that actually carries you all the way to Revelation 22, it's two words. It's land and it's people. It's land and it's people. From the very beginning, God has been determined to create a land and to create a people to live in that land. And the account of creation in Genesis chapter 1 captures that heart of God. What was the promise that was made to Abraham? You will have this land and your descendants, your children, will be the people that occupy it. When God called Israel out of Egypt, what was he doing? He was creating a people for himself. But where were they going? They were going to the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. Land and people. As Israel struggled with sin and, and could not keep its purity of devotion to the Lord, one of the greatest threats that God always leveled against them is, I will kick you out of the land and you will cease to be a people. You see how rich and deep and profound this theology is. One of the greatest declarations we have is that God is not ashamed to call us his people and not ashamed to call himself our God. Now the people of God that he is creating for himself are all of those who give their life to Jesus. And what is the land that he's creating for us? This world is not our home. Peter says that we are strangers, we are foreigners, we are aliens. This land is no longer the greatest of God's promises. But the land that he's creating for us is the new heavens and the new earth. A new creation, a place that we will live as the people of God in the presence of God forever. You see how glorious this is. And it's all right there in Genesis chapter 1. God has absolutely been determined from the beginning to create a people for himself and to create a place for them to live. That's the heart of our God. That's the heart of our God. Well, I've talked more than enough. The end, of course, of the six days of creation is the seventh day. On that day, the Lord rests and establishes a pattern of creation, that six in one pattern of creation. But even that extends all the way into heaven. The author of Hebrews says the great Sabbath rest that we are waiting for is our eternal rest in the presence of God. You know, I think it's right that every single major theme of Scripture is found in the first three chapters of Genesis. If any of you see a theme that's not there, please let me know. But I've heard it said, and I, I haven't ever made a list of every major biblical theme, but I believe that every major biblical theme in its seed form in one way or another is given to us in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And this is what God is doing. God is not just giving us an account of how he made things. He's giving us an account of his character. He's giving us an account of his heart. He's telling us what he's like and what he's going to do and what he is doing. That's what he gives us in Genesis 1. And what a beautiful way to do it. But anyways, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as always, we just want to thank you so much for giving us this time together. And God, we just want to thank you that you are the creator of heaven and earth, of heaven and the land. You are creator of it all. And now we can use words like cosmos and universe and everything else that is because it's all created by you. It's all created by you. There's nothing that has been created that was not created by you.
And Father God, you do not give us in Genesis 1 incredible mechanical details. You do not give us instrumentation. And, and there is a place for that. But as we are simply looking to you and looking to your word, I pray, Lord God, that we would emphasize what you are emphasizing. That there was an absolutely fearful, intimidating, chaotic mess that you spoke life into. You conquered simply with your word. And the good creation that we see now, it is a reflection of your heart and character. And Father, we didn't talk about it today, but obviously creation has fallen and we see that. Mosquitoes bite and floodwaters wipe out uh, coastal towns and earthquakes rip places apart. We see a fallenness and a brokenness in your creation, but we know, Lord God, that one day that will pass away. And because of your incredible kindness to us, we still see so much of that goodness of the first creation all around us. This is still your world, Heavenly Father, and you will ultimately have your way. And so I pray, Lord God, as we embark now on this journey of working our way through Genesis and as elders preaching our way through Genesis, that we will discover you in incredibly inspiring, encouraging, and challenging ways. Stories, Lord God, that we've known since childhood, Noah and the flood and the Tower of Babel and Joseph. But Lord, there is such incredible depth to them, and I pray that we would come to know you better. But thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. And thank you for your heart for us and your heart for your creation. And we pray all of this, Jesus, in your name alone. Amen.